Hello and welcome to the Botanical Biohacking Podcast. I'm Dr. Andrew Miles. Today we're going to go over fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia is characterized by systemic musculoskeletal pain associated with sensitive pressure points. It's often accompanied by fatigue, sleep disorders, memory challenges, and emotional distress. It's associated with poor distribution of nitric oxide. This gives it a common etiology with multiple chemical sensitivity, chronic fatigue, and major depression, as well as anxiety. 3.4% of women in the United States suffer from fibromyalgia. Women are much more likely to develop fibromyalgia than men. Many people who have fibromyalgia also have tension headaches, TMJ, irritable bowel disorders, as well as food sensitivities associated with gut dysbiosis. Unfortunately, this disease is not only painful, it's also very expensive. The direct costs for people with fibromyalgia are around 4000 per year. People with severe fibromyalgia, about 65%, spend about $10,000 per year on this horrible syndrome. Indirect costs such as job restriction can cost 30000 per year. This is because people have to work part-time instead of full-time or they can't work at all. Fibromyalgia is caused by long-term stress, poor diet, and irregular sleep cycles. This creates a combination of gut dysbiosis, which is poor gut flora balance, and improper distribution of gazotransmitters such as nitric oxide and hormonal imbalances leading to chronic inflammation. According to the Merck Manual, fibromyalgia is a common non-articular disorder of unknown cause characterized by generalized aching, sometimes severe, widespread tenderness of muscles, areas around tendon insertions and adjacent soft tissues, muscle stiffness, fatigue, and poor sleep. Diagnosis is clinical. Treatment includes exercises, local heat, stress management, drugs to improve sleep, and analgesics. Fibromyalgia diagnosis is relatively subjective and is determined more by ruling out other diseases such as RA, rheumatoid arthritis. There is a blood test called the FMA that identifies markers produced by immune system blood cells in those with fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia is often treated as a no-man's land of diagnosis. The answer to fibromyalgia requires a multidisciplinary approach that looks at the body as a systemic whole. There's a story about the mistake of looking from a single perspective. A king in India once settled a debate by asking several blind men to touch an elephant. The king asked the blind men to describe what they were feeling and how it would best be used. One man grabbed the tail and said, It's a rope. It's best used for construction projects. Another man grabbed a hold of an ear and said, It's a fan, best used for cooling the room. A third man touched the foot and said, It's a pillar, ideal for supporting the roof. The last man touched the tusk and said, This plow is perfect for tilling the fields. Nowadays, a doctor notices pain that increases with weather changes and assumes that it's all about immune factors. Another may view it from the standpoint of acupuncture points, tender spots, and fascial adhesion. Another treats the thyroid, and still another works through the gut floor and claims that all fibromyalgia is due to leaky gut. All of these may be helpful, but ultimately these isolated approaches are still like the blind men groping around in the dark. You can't discover the truth about fibromyalgia from isolation. You must look in the light of context. The light of context is that fibromyalgia is chronic pain caused by at least eight separate yet overlapping causes. The predominant factor that causes pain can and does change based on weather patterns, diet, psychological triggering, sleep, and mitochondrial levels. This variability is why fibromyalgia seems so random. For anyone who has been on a fibro forum or talked to a fibro support group, you've heard stories that are terrifying and make the situation seem bleak. 
A woman is diligently practicing yoga. She's feeling better by the day. And then suddenly, for no apparent reason, the pain is back with a vengeance. She's doing everything, quote, right. She summoned every bit of willpower. Why was the yoga suddenly not helping anymore? This lack of understanding is terrifying and leads many to believe that they are cursed and that the solution is hopeless. A doctor cured several patients with a special diet. It worked exceptionally for some, but not at all for others. Why? A body worker made one person feel normal again, but caused the next patient to have extreme spikes in pain. Why? The simple answer is because there are eight different overlapping causes. Seeing them with clarity will allow you to flexibly adapt. It will help you to know what to use to help alleviate pain, when to use it, and when to stop. In most cases of long-term fibromyalgia, all of these mechanisms are at work to one degree or another, but one will play a predominant role, and alleviating it will allow the others to follow. Finding that first domino creates a metabolic cascade that increases energy, decreases pain, and improves quality of life. To really understand fibromyalgia, imagine trying to renovate a dilapidated house. After years of neglect, it's fallen into disrepair. The windows are broken, the basement's flooded, the plants are growing up through the moldy floorboards in the living room. Now imagine that someone has told you that uncomfortable homes are caused by moldy carpets. It's a perfectly reasonable explanation. You tear up the carpet in the living room and replace it. There is certainly less mold. But no one has repaired the windows or the leaky roof. After a while, it starts to rain and the carpet is moldy once more. As a result, you forget the mold and hear from a specialist that in order to maintain a comfortable home, the thermostat must be working properly. So you crank up the heat, but the house is still flooded and the windows are broken. Repairing this house seems like an impossible task. This is because nobody's looking at the big picture. Without context and an order of operations, most of the effort is wasted. As a result, people honestly believe that there is no cure. This is like deciding that a home can't be functional because you installed a furnace while the windows were still broken. To make improvements that will last, you would first seal the windows, patch up the roof, after this, we would drain off the flooded water, repair the electrical system, tear out the damaged wood, hire workers, get materials, install new pipes, and finally a heating system. These stages overlap, yet must be addressed in the correct order, or else it can lead to relapse. The stages address the following conditions in sequential order. The eight main contributing factors are lymphatic dysregulation and biofilms gut dysbiosis, nitric oxide dysregulation associated with elevated cortisol, prostaglandin dysregulation, and platelet adhesion, mitochondrial myopathies, venous insufficiency, low DHEAs associated with with hypothalamic pituitary adrenal thyroid dysregulation. And finally, dysregulation of ACTH and cortisol, especially depressed levels of ACTH after long-term illnesses associated with lumbar pain and low body temperature. So many people will ask, okay, how do I identify which cause I have? What I find clinically is that if people have had fibromyalgia longer than a couple of years, eventually the body starts to break down such that all eight are involved. And the challenge comes because all of these eight are just like pickup sticks that are thrown into a pile. And as you start to lift up one, if it's not in the right order, strategically, you can start to disrupt another. So one type of pain may be decreasing while another is increasing. And this is because the different types of pains are telling you different things. They're associated with different underlying causes. Generally speaking, 
there is an order that I have found the most successful, so successful that if people just go through this process of strengthening the body in this order, they can largely reduce pain and recover from fibromyalgia on their own. I absolutely love seeing people go from being in a state of increasing incapacity to getting stronger by the day, such that at month, about month two to three, they're in a state of very low pain or pain-free, and then moving toward the strengthening phase where, you know, they can go have drinks with their family on the beach and it's okay. They can travel again. They can connect with people. That is a truly beautiful thing. As to the diagnostic process, as to the treatment strategies, it's become so efficient at our practice that it is it is boring at this point. And with that, it's safe and stable enough that I can open this up and say, okay, everybody, this is what's working 80 to 90% of the time. There are, of course, outliers that I need to look a little more strategically at, but it's just so effective that I really feel bad sitting on it. So with this podcast series, I want to make it as simple as possible so that Listeners at home who may be treating patients who have fibromyalgia or who may have family members or have fibromyalgia themselves will know the most efficient strategies that I've found after studying with some of the best doctors in China, having a background in Qigong and martial arts, and then having used this method successfully in my practice on many hundreds of patients. Before we begin, though, I must get it out there that there are certain cases that this will probably not work for. There are very rare cases where people are just born with really bad DNA. I mean, people who have every type of burning pain from the time they're three years old, burning, electric, moving, all of these types of pain. There are rare outlying cases where people are just kind of, for whatever reason, they're born with this. For these type of people, they really have to hold out for, in my opinion, gene therapy. Now, the strategies presented here will definitely take that pain and tune it down quite a bit, but when I'm talking about being pain-free or strengthening to the point that this type of pain rarely or never returns, this doesn't apply to these outlying cases, and this is probably one in a thousand people I've seen who are like this. The other types that this approach won't work on are people who self-identify with their disorder. And this is something I did not see in the Chinese hospitals, but I saw pretty strongly in America. What I saw was people tattooing uh, fibromyalgia emblems on themselves, making fibromyalgia their whole life, identifying as fibros, having quote fibro friends. Now, support groups are great. It can be um, very good to remove the isolation. But when the whole identity and culture revolves around illness, it becomes the opposite of a health club. What you really want to be focused on is being in an environment that's positive and is focused on solutions. There, I've seen fibromyalgia groups be tremendously helpful when they're focused on the solutions. And if you're A part of a fibromyalgia group or leading one, I strongly recommend that you take the principles that I'm going to go over and also look at the herbal formulas that I'll be mentioning because the strategies are the most essential. There are 10,000 tools, but there's one strategy that will be ideal for a person's situation. And understanding what those types of pains are trying to tell you will be essential in understanding. So when there's dull pain, when there's wandering pain, when there's electric pain, all of these are specific messages. And once you know what they mean, you can tend to them. I remember I was at a a very conservative church when I was 12 or 13, and some of the older women at the church said, well, babies are going to cry anyway, so you just leave them in the crib and let them scream their lungs out. And then I remember a few years back, there was a book, and it described how to listen to what the types of cries babies make mean. 
And as a result, it was very efficient. So you could hear kind of a suckling sound in the cry, then you know, okay, the baby's hungry. Or kind of a grunting, maybe the baby is, you know, needs the diaper changed. By tuning in to what the baby actually needed, it became much, much more efficient. The same thing is true with fibromyalgia, with chronic pain, with chronic fatigue. You need to tune in to what these signals are trying to tell you, what these types of pain mean. And once you translate that, you can adapt in a very real-time manner. So when you have a cramp, when you have a pain that's wandering from one shoulder to the knee, you know immediately what to do for relief. Sometimes it's as simple as going to your refrigerator, getting some ginger, using a home therapy. It can be as simple as knowing where to place the heating pad can be knowing when ice will make a condition worse, even when it feels like it's helping at the time. The more attuned you are to your body and what the types of pain are trying to tell you, the faster and simpler this process becomes. Then you can go through the overall strategy. That typically gets people to a state of pain going from a level 8 to a level 1 or 0, within about three months. That's the median time that we find. For some people, it's two weeks. For the some, some people, it's four months or five. The median time is about three months. And when pe- that's, I should say, that's very pessimistic. When people are actively doing everything that they need to get better, it actually goes much faster. There are people who They have jobs, they have people depending on them, they need to get better, they tend to get better a lot faster. The people who I won't work with anymore are those people who, because they're sick, they're getting paid. Either they're on disability or their family is supporting them. What I find in these cases is in this state of chronic inflammation, people's decision making becomes like... If you've had a fever for a week and you can't really think straight, you're not the best decision maker. Then you think of yourself in that situation, a few days into a high fever, a little bit delirious. Now put on the other side of that, the idea that you need to run a marathon. And then put on the other side of that, that if you fail, you won't be able to get benefits of some kind or another. In that mental state, it's just way too easy to go, oh, to hell with it, give me a pill. And that's where quite a bit of opiate addiction comes into play. For these people who are benefiting from the disease, I'm not able to help them simply because the intention isn't in line with the treatment, at least not 100%. And to do this doesn't require giving it your all, it doesn't require giving it 100%, but what it does require is gently and quietly and easily putting your focus in one direction and allowing it to heal. Then to the next stage and the next stage sequentially. And as this happens, these are investments of energy and time and an intention and attention. And they're very easy to begin with. What they do is they unlock more energy. And what you do is you take a portion of that energy and you reinvest it back into the healing process so that as you go, it's unlocking more and more energy as pain dials down, inflammation dials down, energy goes up, mitochondria healing. It becomes a very beautiful positive cycle where you might go from not being able to eat very many foods to having a very flexible digestive system that's able to cope with and accommodate a variety of foods and a variety of weather conditions. So ultimately, this is about adapting to change. This is adapting to the types of pain and making your body stronger and more resilient. This system and this process is so good that I've even had athletes use it and they're able to increase their performance because ultimately this is about developing and strengthening the body. Looking in through it from one system to the next from the outside to the inside, and then from the inside to the outside. We'll go through this process step by step, starting with the immune system and then getting down into the deeper hormones and gene expression that's at work 
with fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, and also disorders like PTSD, burnout, and long-term depression. Thanks again. This is Andrew Miles with Botanical Biohacking. Please remember to rate and review on Stitcher and iTunes. We love those five-star reviews. They help other people to see this podcast. And also, please feel free to send a link to this podcast, refer it to your family and friends. This is how we keep the word out and we can help people to help themselves.